turn in our Bibles now to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. And I want to say hello to all of our friends there at Harvest Orange County. Let's welcome them right now. This is our extended family. God bless you guys. Also Harvest Orange Crest and Eastvale. Welcome to all of you. The title of my message is The God of the Living. Heard a story about a man who had just died and gone to heaven. And as he was standing outside of the pearly gates, he was greeted by Simon Peter. And Peter started going through the book of life to see if this guy qualified to get into heaven. And Peter said, you know what, buddy? Um, I'm looking up your records and I'm not finding a lot on you. It's not like you've done anything really bad in your life. But then again, I don't really have any record of anything good you've done in your life. Can you tell me one good thing that you ever did while you're on earth? Because if you can, you're in. So the guy says, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I can. Uh, there was this one time when I'm driving down the street and I, I see a motorcycle gang around a woman. Her car broken down. They were circling her. They were closing in on her. So I pulled my car over, jumped out, popped the trunk, grabbed a tire iron, ran right into the middle of the group, and I said to them, if you want to get to this girl, you have to go through me first. And then I hit one of them on the head to make my point. Peter said, whoa, that's impressive. When did that happen? The guy said, like, three minutes ago. <laughs> Get it? He's, like, in heaven. He's... Okay, that joke is so riddled with theological error, I don't really want to go into it. But it's just to make a point. And, and the point is this. I have really lame jokes. No, there's another point. That's true. But this is the other point. And that is, one day, before we know it, and in some cases, quite suddenly, we may find ourselves in the presence of God in heaven. You know, sometimes as you're getting older, you know it's approaching, you're thinking about it a lot, but then there are times when there is no warning. You don't know this is going to be your final day, and you're hurtled literally into the presence of God, and there you stand. Well, look, I don't know about you, but when I take a trip, I want to know about where I'm going. The first thing I check is the weather because I want to pack the right clothes. Is it cold? Is it warm? Is it rainy? It seems like whatever I pack, the weather always changes the moment I get there. You know, if it's hot, the moment I get there, a cold snap just came in. If it's cold in the middle of the winter, a heat wave arrives just the moment that I land. And so I seem to always have the wrong clothes. But I like to know the lay of the land. I may talk with someone that's been there before and say, hey, you know, where's a good place to eat when I'm there? Tell me about this place, what to expect. Listen, all of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ are headed to heaven. So the more we know about it, the better, right? So we need to be prepared. And the reason we need to be prepared is because heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Jesus said, I have gone to prepare a place for you. You know, a lot of people believe in the afterlife. Uh, actually, the numbers are higher than ever. A recent global survey was conducted asking people about their belief in God and the afterlife. And of the 18,000 people polled across 23 countries, the following was revealed. 51% were convinced there was an afterlife and a God. That's around the world. Now in the United States, belief is even higher. 76% of Americans believe in heaven, and of those, 71% think it's an actual place. Now, belief in the afterlife is not unique to our time. Uh, almost every culture believes that there is something beyond the grave. The Egyptians believe that, of course. Archaeologists discovered a solar boat in one of the tombs of the pharaohs that had died 5,000 years ago, intended for him to use to sail through the heavens into the next life. Ancient Greeks would often place a coin in the mouth of a corpse to pay their fare across the mystic river of death uh, into the land of a mortal life. American Indians would bury a pony in a bow with arrows with a dead warrior so that he could ride into the happy hunting ground. Norsemen would be, uh, bury a dead hero's horse with him so he could ride proudly into the afterlife. 
the Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in Elysian fields with their horses grazing nearby. Eskimos of Greenland who died in childhood were customarily buried with their dog who would help guide them through what they believed was the cold wasteland of death. So think about all these views of the afterlife. Horses for Romans and Norsemen and dogs for the Eskimos in the afterlife. Notice no cats. Because a cat would not guide you in the afterlife. If a cat even got to heaven, which is highly unlikely, <laughs> if animals do indeed go to heaven, a cat would abandon you completely. <laughs> now all of these views are skewed or outright wrong, but the one thing that they have right is there is life beyond this life. Well it's interesting to note that in the time of Jesus, many of the Jews had an aberrant view of the afterlife because they didn't look at what the Scripture taught. And that brings us to the Sadducees who are featured in our stories. Uh, they came to Jesus provoking Him with a question. Now we often read of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and we think of them as one group, but in reality they could not be more bitterly divided. The Pharisees were what we might call the theological conservatives of the day. They believed in the teaching of Scripture. They believed in an afterlife. They believed in a final judgment. The Sadducees might be described as theological liberals. They did not believe what the Bible said about a final judgment or an afterlife. In fact, they only accepted the first five books of Moses as being inspired by God. They did not believe that there was any kind of a resurrection. But the thing is, is the Sadducees were very powerful. There were the aristocrats of Jerusalem being largely in control of the temple. And they also were responsible for the operation of the priesthood. And it was through the temple concessions of money changing and the selling of sacrifices that they obtained their wealth. <laughs> so needless to say, they weren't real happy with Jesus because on two occasions he went into the temple and overturned the table saying, you've taken my father's house which should be a house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves. And so they were angry at Jesus and the question that we're about to read uh, was posed by them to put him on the spot. They had this bleak worldview. No life beyond the grave. Maybe that's why they called themselves Sadducees because that's sad. You see? I mean really. To think there's no life beyond the grave that when you die you simply cease to exist. But that is a belief that is held by some today. Actress Natalie Portman was asked about the afterlife in a recent interview and she said, quote, I don't believe in that. This is it and I believe it's the best way to live, end quote. Actor George Clooney was asked his views on the afterlife. He said, I don't believe in happy endings and I do not believe, uh, and I do believe in happy travels because you die at a young age or you live long enough to watch your friend's life, uh, your friends die. Life is a mean thing, really, end quote. Actor William Shatner of Star Trek fame, who now is around 80 years old, uh, is not so sure about the afterlife. He said in an interview, there's a sense of not being fulfilled. I don't know what it is. It bothers me because I'm approaching the end of my life and I'm trying to do better at whatever it is I'm doing. I'm not ready to go. It petrifies me. I go alone to a place I don't know. It might be painful. It might be the end. My thought, is it is the end. And then he says this, I become nameless after I spent a lifetime being known. Sad outlook. But according to Jesus, there is life beyond the grave. Well, why should we accept his word over the word of another? Because Jesus is qualified to speak on the topic because he came from heaven and he has returned to heaven. That is why Christ and Christ alone can address this topic with authority. If I want to know about something, I ask an expert. You know, 
Tell me about this place. You were born there or you come from there. What's it like? Jesus is telling us what heaven is like. Jesus said in John 6.38, I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do what I want. Then he said in John 3.13, I the Son of Man have come down to earth and I will return to heaven again. And that's where Christ is now. So now here are the statements of Jesus about the afterlife. Let's read about it. Matthew 22, starting in verse 23. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there was with us seven brothers, and the first died after he had married, and having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother, likewise the second also, and the third, even to the seventh, and lastly the woman also died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus said, you're mistaken. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was just spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Let's pray. Lord, as we explore what you say about heaven, Give us ears to hear. Help us see these things in a new way like we've never seen them before because one day before we know it, maybe sooner than we had planned, we will be in your presence. This is not something we have to dread or be afraid of. In fact, it's something we can look forward to with great anticipation. So speak to us as we open your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there's a few things I'd like to point out about this text. Number one, a believer never dies. By a believer, I mean the man or the woman who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. They never die. There's that statement there in verse 32, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So what happens on the other side, we wonder? Will we remember when we are in heaven and then ultimately in the new earth, our old life in this earth? Will we know each other? Will we still be married? Will we still be us? Or will we be someone else? Well, before we address those questions, let's lay down this basic truth. Everyone is immortal. And by that I mean everyone lives forever. I don't care who you are. You're a believer, you're a non-believer, you're an agnostic, you're an atheist, you live forever. Every Christian, every Buddhist, every Hindu, every Muslim, every person, every Republican, every Democrat, even lawyers live forever. <laughs> so you say, well, that's good news, and that I won't stop existing. Well, that's true. You won't stop existing. You will live forever. But then the next question is, where will I live forever? Let's say that I bought you a one-way plane ticket, and it was first class even. And I said, I'm going to send you off on a journey uh, next week. And you're all excited. You're getting packed. Well, the, the thing you need to be asking me is, Greg, where is this one-way plane fare to? Look at the ticket before you get excited. If it says destination Siberia, don't be too excited. That's not a good place to have a one-way plane ticket to. But if it says destination Maui, Hawaii, Get excited. That's a nice place to go to. So the issue is not am I going to live forever as much as it is where am I going to live forever. And according to the Bible, there are only two options. And they are heaven or hell. But when you put your faith in Christ, you go to heaven and you don't die. You say, what do you mean you don't die? Here's what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now I'm not in denial. I understand that the body breaks down and sometimes shuts down quickly, unexpectedly even. I understand that when we die we're placed in a grave. I know that in that sense we die. But I know in another sense we don't die. We all remember the statement of General Douglas MacArthur when he, in that famous speech to the cadets of West Point, said, 
Old soldiers never die. They just fade away. Well, we can add a new expression. Old Christians never die. They just move away. And where do they move away to? They move away to heaven. And that brings me to my next point. There is a bodily resurrection. There is a bodily resurrection. Jesus says in verse 29, uh, you're mistaken not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. Then in verse 30, for in the resurrection. Now understand this. The very word resurrection speaks of something that is bodily. To say I don't believe in a bodily resurrection is like saying I believe in a sunrise without a sun. The very essence of the word resurrection speaks of the body. Our body will be raised. Job 19.25 we read Job saying, in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see God with my own eyes. I and not another. So know this, you will be you in heaven. You'll have the same thoughts, the same feelings, the same desires, but they will all be perfected. After Christ rose again from the dead, it wasn't another Jesus. It was the same Jesus in his glorified state. He said to his disciples in Luke 24, it is I myself, guys. It's me. To prove it, look, here's the marks of the crucifixion. Remember that event? But here I am now in this glorified state where I can appear in a room and then disappear. So there's differences in the new body and similarities to the old one as well. And there's a lot of confusion about these things because sometimes people have some strange ideas about the afterlife. For instance, some people believe that we become angels. When someone dies, uh, a person might come and say, well, God needed another angel in heaven. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, you don't become an angel. An angel is a created being made by God himself. Men and women don't become angels. Uh, in fact, Jesus elaborates on this over in Luke chapter 20 on the same topic. He says, marriage is for people here on earth, but it's not the way we'll be in the age to come. Uh, for those that are worthy of being raised from the dead won't be married then, and they will never die again. In that respect, they're like angels. They're children of God raised up to new life. So he doesn't say we become angels. He says we are like angels. So let's address a question I already raised. What happens to a Christian when they die? Here's the answer. They go straight to heaven. No stopovers. When I book a flight, I always try to avoid stopovers. The reason being is you can get stuck in airports, especially if you have a stopover in a place like Chicago uh, that will have weather fronts move in and all of a sudden that little uh, switch to the next plane is changing and you're there for hours sometimes overnight so I always try to get a direct flight. Well listen, it's a direct flight to heaven. Uh, the moment you take your last breath on earth you take your first breath in heaven and we go there into the presence of God. You remember that Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Paul in Philippians 1.23 spoke of departing and being with Christ. He didn't say, I'm going to depart and then go into a state of suspended animation or go into soul sleep or have a stopover in Detroit or something like that. No, he says, I'll depart and be with Christ. He also affirmed in 2 Corinthians 5 that he wanted to be away from the body and be at home with Christ the Lord. But when we get to heaven, will we have the same bodies? And the answer is not exactly. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says these perishable earthly bodies will be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. When this happens, when our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that never die, the scriptures will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. So the resurrection body will not be the earthly body merely resuscitated, but the likeness of the earthly body glorified. Let me repeat that. The resurrection body will not be the earthly body merely resuscitated, but the likeness of the earthly body glorified. God will recover from the dust a body with a definite relationship to one's earthly body, but transformed to suit your new environment. See? It's like when our astronauts go into space and if they leave the craft, 
they have a special suit they must wear that's prepared for the environment they're in. Or it's like scuba diving. How many of you have ever gone scuba diving before? Well, uh, you know, you have to put a lot of equipment on. And it's not a lot of fun to wear outside of the water. And if you're doing a beach dive, you have to walk along with all this junk. It weighs a ton. You've got your weight belt on. And then you've got your scuba tanks, which are very heavily, especially if you're carrying two tanks. And then you've got your mask and your uh, other apparatus on. And then you've got, of course, your fins. It's not easy to walk in fins. So it's so awkward, so difficult. But the moment you're in the water, it's a dream. Now all that equipment that was encumbering you on land is helping you in the water. The new body that God will give you will be suited for the new environment that you are going to be in. And when do we get this new body? Now this might be surprising to some. You don't get it the moment you go to heaven. The new body comes at the resurrection. And when is the resurrection? It's the same event as the rapture of the church. So you go to heaven now, you're in God's presence. And then at the resurrection, when the Lord calls us to heaven, that is when those that have gone before us receive their new resurrection body. And if we happen to be alive in the moment when Christ calls us, we get our new bodies at the same time. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, I tell you a mystery, will not all sleep, will be changed in a moment, and the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet will sound, and will be raised imperishable, and we shall be change. That quickly it's going to happen as we're caught up into God's presence. Number three, in heaven things are different and similar but certainly better. In heaven things are different and similar but certainly better. We sometimes wonder what our relationships will be like uh, up there in heaven. Will we recognize one another? We sometimes ask, well, the answer is, of course we will. Listen, here's the operative truth. You'll know more in heaven than you know on earth, not less. Now, here's my question to you. Do you recognize people now? Well, sometimes. It depends. You know, sometimes if you haven't seen someone for a long time and you run into them, you don't even know it's the same person. But generally, we recognize one another, don't we? Well, in heaven, you'll be able to do that. But your mind will be working at full capacity. And then there's that supernatural knowledge that God will give to you and that the sinful encumbrances will be removed. So, of course, we will recognize one another. And so this is great news for us that have been separated temporarily from loved ones, we will be reunited with them again. Our absence from our loved ones is a comma, not a period. But will we be related to one another in heaven? And will we be married in heaven? That's really the question that's posed by the Sadducees. Well, let me say first of all that God is the focus of heaven. Uh, we will worship the Lord in heaven and He is sufficient to meet all of our needs. However, God did design us as human beings with a desire for companionship. We're social people. We interact one with another. Now some are more social than others. Uh, you know, for instance, I like to hang out with people and talk with people, but I have a point where I've had enough and if we're with a lot of people and I have to leave, uh, I'll slip out and I'll say to my wife, come on, and I need the jaws of life to get her out of the room. You know, she's uh, talking, final conversations, you know, and it can go on forever, you know. So, but we love to interact with people. We love to connect with people. Even after God put Adam in a paradise, which before the fall was like heaven on earth in a way, uh, Adam knew something was missing. I mean, God says, here's your job, Adam. Name all the animals. So he's naming them. Here's, but he did notice one thing. There's a Mr. Cat and there's a Mrs. Cat. There's a Mr. Dog, there's a Mrs. Dog, a Mr. Horse, Mrs. Horse. In other words, there was a companion for each one of these animals, but there's just Adam. Well, Adam had God. Yes, he did. But he also wanted companionship, human companionship. And the Lord said, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not like the Lord said, all right, Adam, I wanted to be your all in all, but if I'm not enough, I'll give you a companion. Wasn't that? No, this was God's plan. 
Adam, you can't do this alone. You need help, buddy. And help is on the way. And her name is Eve. And the Lord created her. And then the Lord said, this is good, you see. So that desire for companionship is given to us by God. So when we get to heaven, yes, the Lord is the one we will worship, but we will interact with one another. Our minds will be clearer in heaven, not foggier. The scripture gives no indication of a memory wipe causing us to be unable to recognize family and friends, like the movie Men in Black, remember? And they would take that little device and put it in front of the person. They would forget everything they knew. It's not like we get to heaven and have a collective lobotomy, okay? We're going to remember things on earth. We're going to remember relationships on earth. We're going to remember activities on earth. We're going to have points of reference. What do you do when you get together with friends you haven't seen for a while? Well, you talk about things. You reminisce, right? You go over the old stories again and, and tell them again and hear them again and hear someone tell that same joke again and whatever it is. But that's reconnecting. When you get to heaven, you'll reconnect and you will have recollection of things on earth. It's something, like, well, what's earth? I don't remember earth. What happened on earth? Was I on earth? Who was I? No, no. You remember these things. In fact, we're told over in 2 Corinthians 5 that we'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ or receive what is due us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That's recollection. How am I going to receive a reward for something good I did on my body while on earth if I have no recollection of earth. So sometimes it said, well, you'll only remember the good things on earth, not the bad things, because if you remember the bad things, heaven won't be heaven. Well, I don't know that that's true. There are good people that would hold this view, but, and this is usually based on Revelation 21.4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and no more pain for the former things that passed away. Uh, interesting point, that particular statement is actually not describing heaven. It's describing what happens after heaven comes to earth. So will we know things in heaven? Will we remember things in heaven? Yes. Will we remember happy times in heaven? Yes. Will we remember sad things or will we be aware of sad things? Some would say no because in heaven wouldn't be heaven. I disagree with that. I think we would be aware of all things that we need to know. A case in point, Revelation 6 speaks of those who are martyred for their faith. We call them the tribulation martyrs. These are mere mortals. They're not angelic beings. They're people who have died for their faith in Christ. And in heaven, here's what they say to God. Revelation 6.10. They say loudly to the Lord, O sovereign God, how long will it be before you judge the people who belong to this world for what they have done to us? Will you avenge our blood on these people? Well, what was done to them? They were martyred. Well, isn't that kind of unpleasant? Yes, it is. So these people are aware of the injustice that was done to them. They are aware of the fact that they were on earth. They're even aware of the passing of time on earth, saying, how long, O Lord, until you rectify this? So you say, well, Greg, that, that sounds like heaven won't be heaven. Wait a second. It'll be heaven. Your mind is in a perfected state. And here's the big difference. In heaven, you have perspective. You have perspective. See, perspective changes everything. You can be in a situation that doesn't make sense and suddenly get perspective. Maybe you went through a hardship and then later in life it turned into a good thing and you can look back with perspective and say, oh, that wasn't really as bad as I thought it was at the time. Or a better example might be a child that breaks a toy and as far as they're concerned, their world has ended. Barbie's head has come off. <laughs> you say, it's gonna be okay, sweetie. No, the Barbie said it. it'll be okay. And why do you know it's going to be okay? Because you're going to go down to the toy store and you're going to buy her a new Barbie or whatever. You know, so the point is, you as an adult know this is not a big deal. It's going to be rectified. It's going to be corrected. It's going to be made right. And so in heaven, I think we'll be able to look at things from an eternal perspective, from God's viewpoint, and with that we will be able to honor and worship the Lord. That brings us now to family 
and relationships? Will we be reunited with family in heaven? And this freaks some of us out. Why? Because we have really weird families. <laughs> How many of you are a member of a weird family? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you come from a completely normal family? Raise your hand up. Okay, you probably have the weirdest families of all. Because you're so weird you don't think you're weird. So I admit it. I know there's weird people in my family and I'll even acknowledge to being one of those weird people. So when we think of a heavenly reunion with a, and I'm talking primarily of extended family but it could be immediate family too. When you think of that it's like I don't know if I want to be stuck for all eternity with that weird uncle. Well look, if that weird uncle's a Christian and he's in heaven, he's not going to be weird anymore. Because he'll be in a glorified state. And you're not going to be either because you'll be in a glorified state. But will we be married in heaven? Well, let me take a quick poll. How many of you would like to be married in heaven? Raise your hand up. Interesting. That wasn't a lot of hands. Are, are we all singles here? Let, let me ask you another question. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. That's very interesting. So you're married but you don't want to be married in heaven. So, let's take the poll one more time. How many of you want to be married in heaven? Raise your hand. Oh, a little more. But see, you're struggling because you're saying, but I already read that I'm not going to be married in heaven. So I don't know if I want to say I do want to be married. Well, let's sort of figure this out here for a moment. You still will have relationships in heaven that you had on earth. Receiving a glorified body and be relocated doesn't mean that history is erased. It means history culminates. We can't take material things with us to heaven, but we can take relationships with us. All right? So let's consider this wacky question from the Sadducees. Okay, so there was this woman and she's married and her first husband dies. Then she marries his brother and he dies. Then she marries another brother, he dies. Then marries another brother, he dies. And seven brothers are all dead. Now, whose wife is she in the resurrection? They think this is going to be a, something that will confuse Jesus. Like, oh no, I don't know what to say. Because their whole point is, see, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, this whole resurrection idea. What about this? And they make this whole wacky story up. First thing I would have said if I were Jesus is, what is the deal with this woman? What is she cooking for these husbands? Why would like the fourth guy in still want to marry her? Is this a good thing to do? Jesus puts him in her place. He says, your problem is, verse 29, you don't know the scriptures of the power of God. For when the dead raise, they won't be married. They'll be like the angels in heaven. So the Bible teaches there's no marriage in heaven, right? No. The Bible does not teach that. There is marriage in heaven. Some of you are going, uh-oh. <laughs> but it will be a marriage between Jesus Christ and His bride, the church. That's the marriage in heaven. So what about our relationships one with another as husbands and wives? Randy, Randy Alcorn in his excellent book, Heaven, says, and I quote, Earthly marriage is a shadow, an echo of the true and ultimate marriage. The purpose of marriage is not to replace heaven, but to prepare us for it. He also says, God's plan doesn't stop in heaven. And the new earth, it continues. God doesn't abandon His purposes. He fulfills them. Friendships and relationships begun on earth will continue in heaven richer than ever. So, no, we won't be married to each other like we are now, but we'll still be connected to each other, related to each other. In fact, our relationships will even be stronger, you see. This is the hope of every follower of Jesus Christ, to be one day in heaven. 